Mm -hmm. I didn't check out the minutes, but I hope other people did. I didn't have any changes. Okay. I was good with the minutes. Okay. So I'll go along with that. So we approved the minutes. Um, let's see. Somebody here wants to adjust the agenda, I don't think. So, uh, I guess we can move right on to first item in new and old business, which is. Stack tax stabilization agreements, uh, pilot agreements, and uh, Dave, I, I think I'll refer to you to explain what's going on with this. And uh, we're I'm not Jay. We're not going to discuss um, any particular project here. It's just a general discussion. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because if we did, we'd have to go into executive session, and I don't want to do that. Is there any reason for that? So we'll just do an overview of what's going on. I will talk briefly, though, about the two individual. Well, I won't get into the details other than just a you can small say of the detail, but we do have two. That's contracts okay. out there that I'll get into, but those are public record anyways. So, yeah. um, so last meeting, uh, Mr. Boyeri came to us and uh, raised the um, discussion of tax stabilization agreements for hydroelectric dams, more or less. And we do have a bit of a history uh, with such. Um, Mary's not here, but Gordon and Martha, you kind of went through this going into 2005 um, with the North Heartland, what is now the North Heartland LLC dam. Um, and that was some activity back at that point in time. Uh, but the original or one of the first tax stabilization agreements that we got into dates back to 1988, which is now the Green Mountain Power hydroelectric dam which is a hydroelectric dam located out by the two cover bridges in North Heartland. So we have three out together. Mr. Blairies is towards the smaller end of the spectrum. The North Heartland LLC is towards the larger end of the spectrum. And then the Green Mountain Power one is kind of in between. We did go to vote, just to go back to the 1988 agreement for a moment, um, to put this all into motion, there was a vote at town meeting in 1983, allowing us to enter into tax stabilization agreements. I'm not sure what the impetus was for that, but I believe it was the 1988 agreement for Green Mountain, what was then a different company, but um, is now the Green Mountain Power Hydro Dam. And that agreement was to be looked at every 10 years. Uh, we it went from 1988 to 1998. We renewed it in 1998. It should have um, been looked at again in 2008, neither been discarded or renewed. And to the best of our efforts, we don't believe that was officially renewed, but we've been living by it since 19 or 2008. So that's 30 years old at this point in time. Um, I believe that in particular, the North Heartland LLC dam, the one that we signed in 2005, and I believe to some extent the one that we entered into in 1988, the reason why we entered into these was because they were dilapidated and they weren't really up and running. Um, Particularly in the 2005, that particular property owed us back taxes. I'm going to throw out a number like 250 grand, thereabouts, I believe. Um, and it was in not very good shape, so the town entered into some negotiations to take care of or to get the back taxes or as much of the back taxes as we particularly could and to find a stable tax rate for the life of their license, which expires in 2021, and they're in the process of renewing that. Long story short, we did that to essentially get that back on its feet and kind of up and running. And 
took care of some delinquent taxes and got us moving forward. At this point in time, I have spoken to both Mr. Fletcher, um, who was representing us in our tax appeals, and uh, Mr. Bambi's name is kind of on the, the prior work back in the 90s. Uh, it, it's kind of my take at this point in time that both of those issues are in the rearview mirror. Essentially, particularly the one in 1988, it's now Green Mountain Power. I believe that sale was two years ago. Um, and whatever impetus we're getting into that, particularly with that one, has kind of essentially run its course. Um, the town, as a town, and I gave you this statute here, can enter into tax stabilization agreements. So if you choose to, and it's usually for economic benefits or to promote a particular activity, perhaps hydroelectric electricity, you can, for lack of a better term, manipulate the tax rate. You can stabilize it. You can make it a less number than what the assessed value represents. However, what differs from 1988 and became essentially a part of Act 68 in 1998 is that you can only stabilize the municipal tax rate and not both the municipal tax rate and the educational component to that. So technically the agreement that we signed in 2005, which in the language states any and all basically taxes including municipal, education, state, etc. Not necessarily the case. We cannot stabilize the education component unless we go and take the extra step of presenting this to the Vermont Economic Progress Council and make a legitimate case for making this a lesser tax rate than, than what the assessed value is. So if the board were to decide, hey, we like the idea of stabilizing these hydroelectric dams. The 6.25% off of income, and I'm just kind of going from memory of what that agreement actually says and its most basic part of that, means little to us at this point in time. We don't know, or I would say we may have a guess, but uh, the assessed value, or, or in order to stabilize a rate, you kind of need to know what the property is worth. What kind of a deal are you going to give them? You want to take 20% off the tax rate? Do you want to, you know, give them half? You know, what kind of stabilization agreement do you want to go into? And you kind of need to know the basis of their value. So my recommendation would, would be that if you wanted to take the step of stabilizing these, you actually would go out and assess, maybe hire an outside assessor and assess the value of each of these three properties and come up with a value and say, okay, I'm going to knock 20% off or we're going to do something to come up with a rate that we feel comfortable with. And then we will utilize something similar. I mean, the, the, you would need to do all three and probably all three separately because they're going to have somewhat of a different value to them. Again, one smaller and one's bigger. Um, however, whatever the listers do, and they may take the professional assessed value, and if we don't decide to do that, they go and produce their own assessed value. At some point in time, they still need an assessed value for the educational component. So no matter what we do, it's only 20% of the tax rate. The rest of this is going to follow the process like it normally would if we didn't stabilize it. So the assessors are still going to attach an assessed value to this. It's still going to get a normal tax rate for the educational component. If the hydroelectric dams don't like that, then they can appeal that to the listers, and then they can appeal that to the BCA, and then they can appeal that to the Superior Court. At the end of the day, there will become an, whether everybody likes it or not, an agreed upon value of that property through that process. <laughs> um, but the hydroelectric dams are going to need to, it's two separate tracks, if you, if I can make okay, that clear. Question. Yep. If the tax assessment is appealed, uh, or the dam, or the hydro project, 
that will affect not only the municipal but the school part. Is that correct? So if the town decides not to stabilize these, then it will follow, just like the educational component, it's just going to follow, the assessors will provide an assessed value to this. Both of the, these become liable for appeal. The Worcester's first, then the BCA, and then Superior Court. And at the end of that, there will be a value to that whether they agree upon that value as soon as the lister is given the value or whether they fight it to the nth degree to the Supreme Court for that matter. Somewhere at the end of the day, there will be a value attached to that um, of which everybody will live by and, and move forward and that's what the tax rate will be based off of. Um, from my perspective, the recommendation I would give, I don't quite if we're only talking about 20% of the tax rate and the rest being 80%, so let's just say we give 20% off of the tax rate, 20% or of 20%, um, town is essentially going to lose out the hydroelectric dams are still going to go through the process. They're still going to have an assessed value and still need to pay the educational component in whole. Unless, of course, we take it to the Vermont Economic Progress Council. For two reasons. One, I think that for whatever reason, 15 and 30 years ago, we decided to stabilize these. I don't believe that the same rationale is, is facing us today. And I would look towards the assessing value kind of play out as it normally would and let it go from there. And if I understand correctly, the state has a different set of algorithms for solar farms as far as taxation or, or agreements are concerned. There is an assessing process for solar as well. Mm -hmm. okay. Don't know if we need any. I mean, I think that you need to acknowledge or at least chew on this. If the board does nothing, the Worcesters are going to proceed with Mr. Boeri and the Green Mountain Power entity, and they're going to proceed through the assessing process. They need to do that for the educational component anyways. So they're going to proceed to do that. And they'll be doing the NH pro property as well. They will come up with assessed value yeah. um, because We've never done that, and we may very well need to make up the educational component of that because that's what technically we should be doing since we can't let them off the hook for that. So they will, but we will, and it would be my recommendation, we live by that until 2021, which is November estimated for retirement of that one, I think is November 24th, but uh, they're in the process of renewing the FERC license. <laughs> But until that day, I would live by that. But next fiscal year, we may very well be picking up a somewhat substantial tab of North Heartland LLC's payment to the state that somebody should have been paying all along. That's a big option. At some time, can I make a, just a factual? Sure. I am. It's not to the owner of the Hydro, who built the Hydro first in 1983 and then in 1980 sold to consolidate. The, the by the bridge. Person. Yeah, by the bridge, yeah. And what happened was, as far as why there was an agreement, is that when Consolidated was about to buy it, I also spoke to the person that negotiated with the town of Highland for the that thing. And, and what happened was, is that it, at Superior Court in Woodstock, there was, it, there was um, going to be a decision made about what the tax value should be, uh, because it had gone on for five years. And apparently, um, Peter Welch was the town's attorney, but 
he was late for the meeting. And so the negotiator for the Hydro, the town's negotiator, said, we don't want to be here. So they, in, within an hour or two, came up with, it, with an agreement. It's the agreement that you're talking about today. Having nothing to do with it. It was a, it was a brand new project that it only had to do was that, was that the suit was, was live and superior. So that's kind of how that came to be, why that agreement existed. I asked him if he had a copy of that because people didn't sort of have one. And Roger told me that the agreement or the understanding of the agreement was by Captain David. Meaning that other people couldn't find it, but it was testimony that that's what it was. It was no, no skin off your head. It was nothing to do with you, but it was saying how these things happen. Why You have that in front of you, the stipulation. Uh, I, 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 I tell you the truth. I, I spoke to him after I spoke to you the other day. I said, I, I, could, I could do it, and I don't know if you'll find it. It's going to have a few months, so it's not nothing that's going to happen. We've got it here. I'm already telling you what you took. This is it, right? We've got it here. Oh, you yeah. got it. I think that shed some light on the factual history of 1988. I'm not sure if it changes really anything regarding the discussion at hand. Um, I, I think I've provided you with some nuts and bolts of, of this. Um, again, even with the stipulation, um, under the statute that they quote for being able to enter into this, um, we can't. We can't stabilize the educational component. Um. I'm still not clear. Um, you used two terms when you were talking about the assessed value for um, that the listers could, could approach. Um, and may, maybe you're, maybe it's only one methodology, but is there, are there multiple methodologies that could be used by listers to, to value each of these three properties? We will use a methodology uh, that's recommended by the states based upon output. If Mr. Boyery feels strongly that he feels an argument can be made based upon a different type of valuation, then he's free to do that mm -hmm. in the appeal process. Okay. And how, how is that output determined? You know, do we solicit records from each of the three? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a matter of public record. Okay, it is. You know, I actually had a hard time this morning when I was reading all of this. Um, Phil, if I can just add, I think the board, you know, you shouldn't be confused by the assessing method. The assessing method doesn't really play in here. If somebody has an issue with the assessing method, there's an appeal process for that. Okay. If the town feels like there's a benefit to providing a tax break to a particular entity, whether it be a hydro dam or BG's market, or the D and D excavating, for that matter, based upon you know some right. benefit the town may perceive to get in return, mm -hmm. then a tax stabilization becomes something that the town might be interested in and looking for. Uh, I had a very different sort of reaction this morning. Um, and after last week signing uh, the order for 21 properties to, to go to delinquent tax sale, I, I just found myself saying, um, you know, I, I, I can't bring myself to sort of find a, a solid reason at this point to sort of um, have any uh, a change in the tax rate for either of the three at, the, at this juncture. Um, and I'm, I'm open to be convinced, but I don't see it. Um, 
just a personal comment. <clears throat> if it was 100% um, both property and school, then I think there might be something, a different approach there, but it's not. Yeah, go ahead. I, I actually, I don't agree with everything David says, but in fact, I, I understand his point. And that's what we talked about the other day. Really, if and I haven't, I haven't gone to my attorney to see what I'm going to do because I'm going to wait and see what the uh, listeners are going to do. Um, but um, if it's really true that the agreement can only take in a town's part of the taxes. And you know, I mean, that's that's not a lot. And that's not going to make any difference. So as far as any new payment goes, if it's only going to affect, or again, a portion of twenty percent of the twenty percent, it's you know, I don't want to say it doesn't make any difference, but it's, it's not. Right. And I don't think that that maybe anyone on the board should be angst in that one. I'm not, I'm not saying they couldn't get it in that way. But I think David's point is good. But what people don't understand, and David said a minute ago, that the methodology doesn't matter. I have, I cannot, I just, I can't agree with that less. Disagree with it more. But, uh, the states come up with the method. Uh, it's just nonsensical. I'm a professional. I'm a professional in the matter. But David's right that it doesn't matter what the methodology is. It's important. But for purposes of this discussion, it will probably have to sort itself out. And that's where I think. Right. And this methodology is now part of a state requirement? In talking to David, to, to, um, Mr. Wardell, he said to me, our hands are tied. Mm -hmm. He suggested to me that I go with this is a conversation. He said, you really do need to go to the board and say, hey, can you get any new payment? And but now there's another piece of information that seems to not make this not make this any sense. So the listers are tied. It's mm -hmm. not their method. It's the the modern power of the taxes is dictated mm -hmm. via the case in Rockingham for the for the life budget. And everybody is using that as the basis, and it's just as long and you know, who knows, three years later, I don't know what the other two parties will do, but they'll go back and they'll join another group and yeah. say, This is crazy because when you're thinking of raising some of these property tax, you know, five, six, seven hundred percent, you know. I just would like to alert the board that Mr. Boyery just happens to know what his reappraisal will be. Not anybody else knows that information, nor are they privy or have the opportunity to do what Mr. Boyery is doing now, which is essentially make an argument to four or five of a 12 member BCA board. So I think that we need to keep in mind. You know, the, the process that Mr. Boyer is talking about and the ability for that to, to play through. Um, you know, if you want to make that argument in order to make a tax stabilization agreement, you know, I, I you know, again, at the very least, you got to come up with an assessed value to come with some sort of stabilized number that, you know, I, I don't feel comfortable telling the board we'll stick with a 30 year old number. You know, think about what your property has increased in value over 30 years. I mean, so we've been collecting to put this into perspective, we've been collecting the same amount of tax revenue from this one particular entity now for 30 years. Give or take, you know, a good flow year versus a not so good flow year, we kind of got a little bit of a spectrum. Yeah, but it's been a percentage of value, hasn't it been? 
electricity? I, I, the number has been, the output is essentially similar and has not been looked at for 30 years. Okay, so so hasn't gone I suspect that you would probably, after 30 years and 15 years, take a look at what the assessed value of that property is, <laughs> or that business is, and then renew a contract, you know, based upon some updated information, particularly four businesses later. Eight and five. Well, we'll play it at the end. It's, it's a very difficult number. I've probably done assessed values in the hundreds for maybe, uh, maybe about 15 projects. And each one is different. The age of the equipment plays into it. And, you know, mine's an older project. There's no depreciation. There's so many things. And it's a very complicated decision. And that's something that's going to play out, not in your equipment, but in something else as well. The only catch will be, again, I have no idea what the other two parties are going to do, but you're going to be right back where you were in 1988 with someone who's thinking about, uh, you know, the raising my taxes considerably, and it will be considerably based on the provided by the taxes. And then 1988, you're going to do whatever. I suspect, but I don't know for sure. Well, it's complicated because there's going to be that, Jay, and then there's also this division of the tax between the 80-20 yeah. part. You know, so there's a, a multiple warped thing going on here. And absolutely, and it's, and it's so unfortunate yeah. that, that a party, in this case, Vermont Department of Taxes, who isn't a party to any of the agreements or anything else, that they're the ones that stick their nose in it because the state wants more money for education. And so I, I'm, I'm sympathetic. But it's just a third party entering into this um, picture that they think they know. I mean, my goodness, if they tried to, to do that to the to the fifty thousand farmers in Vermont, they wouldn't get very far. I mean, you have thirty or forty hydros in you know trying to ratchet up the taxes, so it's not a lot of places to hide. I I, I really I, I I'm not expecting you to. Uh, uh, to uh, propose a, what, what you think of, um, yeah, proposing a minimum uh, payment for taxes. Uh, doesn't make any sense to me either, based on what you can say. I'm going to ask this question now because I didn't really get a perfectly straight answer before. <coughs> if any one of the three hydro dams appeals their taxes to the BCA, it's appealing the entire amount, school and all. Is that correct? It's appealing the assessed value given to that property. Yes. The entire of which both the yeah. educational component and the municipal tax rate is based okay. on. So it strikes me as Far better way to go about looking for relief if there is a true, if the particular hydro project feels they are overtaxed. It seems to me a far better way to go about doing something about it than any kind of special agreement on 20% of it. Mm -hmm. I don't see why. It couldn't be successful the same as any other tax appeal if there appears to be an extreme inequity in how it's being assessed. That's my take on it, regardless of how much the state needs money. Of course, they need money, they always do. So we don't we don't have a need to vote on this tonight. If I understand. We see have a burning desire to take it up. I mean, as I mentioned, the the, the process because the contract with between the <coughs> predecessor is not is is gone by. Right. They will take the steps that um, they've got with Mr. Boerian with that particular mm -hmm. 
entity and, and move forth as they would, and we'll see kind of where. Is there anything here that's burning to do a tax stabilization agreement? No, I table. I, I say we table this to a, a longer date, far, far away. Some other day when it's necessary <coughs> at this point. I wish the big guys were here to do it. I am the smallest by far. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, then you could hear from them, and maybe they would give you some outlook some for the future of what they may or may not do. But we don't know what the tax bill is going to look like, so everybody's just going to. There's just not enough, there's not enough information, really. Yeah, one of the things that. <coughs> Dave was talking about when we made the agreement with the, uh, what's it called, the dam, the little flood control dam, which one's that called, what's that called? North Island LLC. North Island LLC. Um, we had quite a bit of um, help uh, from here and there to know, so we could uh, have a lot better idea of what we were doing. Um, and, uh, because yeah. this is not, you know, the agreement shows that. I mean, you break it down by you know, the amount of power generated and you know, various brackets and so on. So it's just that. knowing how you know, <coughs> the economics of hydro generation is not common knowledge. So mm -hmm. Everybody <laughs> knows a lot about it. <laughs> so it, it's, 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 it takes a little educating before you can do these things. Thank you. Really, it was six one. It doesn't. You, know, you either do a fair amount of work up front and come to something, or you let it go to a more natural or a different yeah. forum, and you may end up enlisting some of the same folks. But I think you're going to come up with a number, more or less. Either way. Really, most of the state's process was more transparent to, to, to say that what their methodology is, as far as I know what this is. They only, made, they only created one number for one budget, and that's the duty of the campaign. Everybody was supposed to scare it to somehow. So it's not transparent. And that just makes it less than one of the things. Safe watch. Well, that, yep. else, <laughs> I've said my piece. You know, I, I'm, I have people who, and, and I read enough to also know that there's pressure on hydros in general from an environmental perspective. And I don't feel that that is that any of an issue in Vermont, but we do know that Vermont is conscious of that for whole dams, especially. Yeah. But, it, but it's also going to play in solar. I mean, the wind isn't taken uh, off in the lawn as much as it should. But yeah. the state is going to control the, the, the tax rate for these projects. And you're going to see more of it. I mean, even just the project down in the that on the ferry boat. Right. You know, now the price is going to try to come into town. Yeah. It's, it's not a, you know, it's, it's, not a, it's not the welcome way. And you know, when the, the state is proposing to do some new problems. It doesn't make a lot of sense to think the state is uh, deliberately driving up the cost of electricity. State needs to make, raise raise taxes. They need money for, for the general coffers, and so they get it where they can get it. Yeah. Let's move on. Discuss the budget update. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Jay. Thanks. Have a good evening. Bill.
through the budget update. Start with the general fund. Um, I'm going to do this. Um, Mark was gone last week, and he's got something coming up. So um, I'll do the report here. Uh, general fund, we are 10. This is through the end of April. So uh, this report, we're through 10 months, uh, which is about 83.33% through the year. Um, it is, I got a few things to add, but uh, as far as the overall budget goes, it has been the same story essentially since December, maybe even last fall, where the drivers of our overage are the legal fees and the activity center. And uh, to a small amount, we've had some overages in the highway garage. Um, again, mostly maintenance. And uh, the fuel is over, but there, there might be a coding issue there. Um, and that is driving any overage for us. Uh, I have just want to come back to um, income for a moment. We don't usually talk about income, but I'd like to spend a few moments on it tonight. Uh, if you look at both the income revenue for the recreation department, uh, and you look at the expenses for the recreation department. Uh, I've been, been kind of alluding the last couple of months that uh, we're down as far as participation goes at the rec center. Uh, the rec center revenue was only at 75.57%. Again, if we were kind of treading. Mm -hmm. Well, Rec Center revenue is trending at about 75.57%, which is fairly low. Uh, we do get additional revenue as we get towards July with the summer camp program. Everybody kind of pre-signs up, but we're getting that now, actually. Uh, however, it would be off, and under normal circumstances, I would be more concerned. But if you look at the expense side of this, um, which is back on the expenses, that is running at about 70% expensed. So as normally the case, uh, and that is on page five. five. So kind of normally the case, um, Rec center expenses, whether it be after school program, you know, items or, or waiver that we need to have for however many kids are participating, um, is lower. And therefore, the revenue, which would be from those participating, basically user revenue, is down. Most of the time, it's kind of going the other way. I get people saying, hey, we're all way over budget on the rec center. Uh, but then you look at the revenue, and we've got a whole lot more revenue than we expected, and it kind of coincides. In this case, they're both trending downward. Uh, again, I think we're getting some, the library is doing uh, some things over there uh, that is taking some kids. And um, you know, I think that participation is just down a little bit, whether it be from uh, enrollment at school or just some other things. Um, and I think that enrollment is also playing, kind of playing in here. The other important thing I want to show you on the revenue side on page one, uh, I have pointed out to you the state of Vermont hold harmless. This is just a simple budgeting snafu. Uh, we budgeted 212,000. We got in 184,000. Uh, that had been trending upwards. Uh, and it took a sharp dive last year and this year downwards. And uh, I'm not sure if the trend upward was just we weren't um, not sure of the disconnect, other than the fact that the state is getting a little bit more organized, still not a whole lot, but uh, more organized than maybe they were three, four years ago. I know they hired another person over there. Uh, and they're straightening out the records, and uh, we're getting um, changes in the land use um, quicker, but um, that 184 is all that we'll see. And we had budgeted 212, so that's like a $27,000 discrepancy. But I've put this out to you guys 
Mm -hmm. I don't know, three, four months, five months back, I think Martin, we talked about this. So that's nothing new. Um, however, another discerning uh, issue is on the Windsor County tax. Um, it says minus, but it should be a positive. 31500 we're supposed to collect for the Windsor County tax. Uh, essentially, we didn't collect Windsor County tax this year. And I chalked this up to just turnover, um, particularly from Carolyn to Deb, from Deb to, to Martin. Uh, and this uh, actually confused me even a little bit through this transition. Uh, it doesn't really matter which way you do it. We took it out of the budget completely back in like 2015, 2014, I think thereabouts. Simply just basically because you have no control over the North, the Windsor County tax. Okay, whatever essentially that tax is, um, the town needs to pay it. It's not something we can vote on. Um, we do need to take it. So I believe for that reason, we just took it out of the budget. So there was really no discussion on it. When Deb came back, it got inserted back into the budget, kind of for transparency reasons. But prior to her in 2015, we had a separate tax rate for the Windsor County tax. So you had local, you had basically municipal, you had highway, mm -hmm. you had local, and then you had Windsor County tax separate. We haven't had that separate tax since 2015, that separate tax rate. Uh, can I ask you to pause for a moment? I'm not familiar with the concept of the county tax. So we do have a somewhat weak, but it is a county system here in Vermont. Basically, is made up of the court system and the sheriffs. So, okay. um, so what Dave's <clears throat> referring to, partly, is it's a different way of paying that than we had, say, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know the details, but I know there was a change. Okay. <clears throat> that just didn't properly funnel through the changeover. So there used to be kind of a separate tax. You don't need to do it that way. You can do it like we do, you know, how it, you know, how we do it is we essentially look at expenses. We essentially look at all the revenue that we're going to or expected to get. We subtract the revenue from the expenses and we get a number that we need to raise for taxes. Mm -hmm. When this got inserted back into the budget, we never looked at, we needed to raise that specific number. So we haven't for the past, you know, 16, 17, 18 type thing to my, as far as we can tell. So the good news here is that we're going to come back to pilots and, and tax stabilizations, but we put this on a different line item because it's not, they don't get a tax bill per se. By contract, they just send us money in March. Um, Green on Power sends it monthly. North Hartland LLC sends it at the end of March. So we put those on a separate line item from the um, the wind, from the, the actual current taxes, and that number is thirty seven nine ninety seven. But that was more than we were anticipating. So it kind of makes up for that Windsor County tax. 31,500, we were somewhat absorbed by some of the overage from that um, um, that pilot payment. But however, we're still short one or the other. We're still short the pilot, um, the state hold harmless, I'm sorry. So we're still short about $30,000 on revenue. I will get too, too much into the weeds, but we did get $11,000 back from the school than we, more than we expected, simply because of the way the state formula shakes out. It's a very long, complicated discussion I don't want to get into, but we made up a little bit there. How's that? Okay, so that's the general fund. Okay. Uh, highway, this gets pretty convoluted as well. Um, but I'll stick to I'll stick to the basics. Uh, highway is running um, again pretty well uh, on target, with the exception of 
the things that we kind of knew that we're going to run run over, which is uh, subcontracting due to the trucking of the hard pack material we brought in last August, September. Um, the hard pack itself is over, um, and that's kind of it. What is a bit of a surprise, um, although it shouldn't be, is our winter budget went over by um, over $20,000. Uh, and particularly if you look at the sand, um, that's an 18,000, or I'm sorry, the salt. The salt is an $18,000 overage in and of itself. Um, but based upon the activity that we had this year, um, it hurts from a budgeting perspective, but shouldn't surprise us from the winter that we had. Um, the one other thing I want to point out to you of concern on the highway is not on the operating budget itself, but on the equipment. Uh, this doesn't really affect the operating part of the budget um, other than if you back out, if you look on page two of three on the highway and you look under equipment, Sorry, Matt, the first page is one of the revenue. Yeah. The second page is one of three. That's where the expenses start. So am I on the right page now? No, I'm not. Oh, I see it now. Okay. okay. Equipment. Yeah. So equipment, page two or three of the expenses for the highway. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, under equipment, the last line is equipment reserve, 143,685. It's kind of an estimated number based upon past years of supplies, maintenance, and stuff. This is kind of a new way of presenting this to the select board. And this is the reason why, is because it was always very difficult to determine how much we're actually sending to the equipment reserve. So we were estimating 143,685. The only problem is, is the remainder amount of that, which makes up actual technically operational expenses, the supplies, maintenance, tires, is about at budget. We've got maybe another six, $7,000 left before we exceed our budgeted numbers. If we do that, that means the less we're gonna have to send to the equipment reserve. And this is why we broke this out, is to get a better grasp on what these maintenance and supplies and, and truck expenses are in comparison to what we're sending to the equipment reserve. So I know that we've got some decent bills coming down the pike. We're still haggling over the, the all-wheel drive vehicle with them to a point, but um, I expect probably a $6,000 bill on that anyways. So that means that we'll probably have less than 143,685 to put in reserves. So this is a number that we're trying to track and get a better grip on as to you know, what the expenses are for the trucks versus what's actually going into the reserves. So in the past, has the equipment reserve been built on simply the cost, projected cost of replacement for trucks uh, or the cost of the trucks plus the ongoing maintenance of the So it wasn't a bad idea. It was actually pretty useful, but we, we again we can track it within these numbers because when we when we input the expense, we put, you know, for instance, for maintenance, we say, you know, within that twenty three thousand dollars we've expensed, you know, let's just say the last maintenance issue was three grand for like truck two or something. Mm -hmm. So we actually entered in that so if we you know, drill down on that number, we can see kind of where those expenses are going. What we did prior is we had like a four page, five page output of every piece of equipment that we had. Okay. And so if there was a maintenance expense, it hit the piece of equipment individually. So you might, which was beneficial, you might look and say, okay, truck six had $8,000 worth of maintenance, right. you know, Truck eight is, you know, showing some wear and tear, but internally we kind of knew that already. It was difficult to add it all up and say, okay, these are, 
you know, all the expenses of all the vehicles and stuff that we had, how much is actually going to the equipment reserve? Mm -hmm. That number was just a whole lot of work to get to that, and we're trying to track that a little bit easier here. I bring it up tonight simply to say, by the time we hit July 1st, my guess is, is that we won't have the estimated 143,685. We'll have a number still significant, but just less than that. But this is info we're trying to build over the next, you know, five, six years to get a better, you know, grasp on what we need to put because we put a significant amount of money towards the equipment reserve and, um, you know, we just like to know how much is actually for future purchases and not just immediate yeah. operational purchases. Okay. I'll cut it. Cool. Uh, I'll answer the question. What's not in here is paving. Paving will be a very big expense. It's going to make this budget a little bit convoluted because paving makes up fiscal year 19, fiscal year 18, and part of fiscal year 20. Um, but anyway. Good question. So actually, Ed, thank you for bringing that up. Um, actually, we're not going to end up in the black. So what is going to prevent us from ending in the black is that $75,000 that we budgeted that's essentially supposed to go towards deficit spending from years prior. So as of today, I'm guessing that we've used up out of that 75,000, maybe about 40 grand, leaving us with about 35 to go towards that deficit. So we didn't do what we needed to do as far as, if, if we had landed expenses, met revenues perfectly, um, we, would seven, we would have $75,000 to apply towards the deficit. <clears throat> We're going over budget, and that's not including the revenue, because revenue gets difficult as well, because when you try and factor in the, uh, delinquent taxes, throws things off, but just as it is, without messing with the revenue side of life, if we're just looking at where we are for expenses, um, I would say we're about 40 over as of today, which means that um, we don't have all of the money that we were going to apply towards the deficit. Um, and that coincides, um, when you look at the legal fees and the activity center combined, those two were about $50,000 over. Um, so they, you see that, you know, that has been, we've known this since almost from day one, last July when we got into the activity center or last fall, and um, with the appeals on the uh, legal front, we kind of um, have seen that coming, so that shouldn't surprise us at this point in time, but um, we just um, we just don't have the money that we were. The reasoning for that $75,000 would fully be realized to go to the test. That makes sense. Okay. Well, so we move on to the Something that came in after this went out to you folks, um, we did hear uh, Superior Court. So there's a couple pieces to, if you recall, the um, Todd Heyman appeal mm -hmm. uh, on, from Best Road. Um, an important component of his argument was the um, fact that grievances didn't start exactly on June 19th. They started on June 21st, therefore everything is null and void, and his tax rate goes back to 
um, the year before, the judge ruled against him, so that is not the case, so that argument doesn't hold. Uh, so there's three, two arguments, strong arguments that he had. Two have been ruled against him. He still has the ability to make an argument about the valuation uh, that the listers came up with, um, but two of his main arguments have, have ruled against him. So I don't know what he has to argue against the valuations that the listers came up with, but um, there is one more, potentially one more step if Mr. Heyman decides to take that. Uh, a couple other things that are a little bit different. The three corners intersection, the okay. grant. Yep. Just knowing we're racking up legal fees, are, are we still with? Are we still engaged paying legal fees for, for for this process, or is it actually just in the judge's lap right now? And we're ready? Uh, with both Mr. Percy and Mr. Heyman, we potentially could see a another court visit to argue the valuation of, you know, again, there's, when you go to this point as de novo, so, you know, if you appeal, it essentially, if he can prevent evidence to show that his property is worth Y, but the listers came up with X, he's free to make that argument. Mm -hmm. Two of his arguments that he made the loudest have been ruled against him. Now, I don't know what he, you know, the, the listers put together certain information to come up with a valuation. I don't know what he has to argue against the valuation. But we potentially could see a, another court visit uh, on both. Okay. Uh, I don't anticipate that will be this fiscal year, uh, but it certainly may be next uh, fiscal year okay. if they decide to do that. It appears that Mr. Percy has decided to take that step. It's tough to say. Okay. Right. Um, spoken about the grant, the bike ped grant with this project, um, kind of moving along with that. Uh, I spoke about some hesitation just to bring that to the board last time. I bring that again. Uh, again, I'm proceeding with it, but the thing that I'm just having difficult time in my head is that we are on the one yard line at this point in time. And to proceed with the grant, there's certain things in that grant that may push us back to like the 45 yard line. So my question would be, you know, you're third and one on the goal line, or do you want to go back and be first, you know, down on the 45 and give up all the yardage that you've gained. You're such a good hunter. So, and a field goal, and a field goal is not gonna, a field goal is not gonna win it. It's gotta be a touchdown. No, no, I put it on the table first. So um, we're proceeding with the, um, yeah, uh, Bill has his easement in front of him. Um, uh, Mr. Mamby, after taking care of Mr. Dunn, is uh, working on uh, Mr. Garthwaite's easement. As far as the underlying project goes, it's all that's really left on the underlying project. The utilities, we still need to pull together um, estimates on the alternative aspect of that. Um, the grant, I, you know, it's going to be a decision is, you know, could provide a a financial gain and be very beneficial, but I think that we may end up giving up yardage for the financial gain, and it's a matter of time and going through certain steps again. And I'm not sure, you know, I'm just not sure that you want to give up the yardage for the gain at the end of the day. But um, I think I'll know more uh, perhaps as I continue this week, but I just put that out there as I pursue the bike pad grant. Yeah, we aren't sure about the yard of this pharmacy at all. Very good business is here, I don't think. We don't know for sure where we are. Um, my, my, my fear is, is with the with the grant is we lose the artist on the underlying project. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we go yeah, back exactly. and we got to revisit, you know, yeah. easements again, and we got to revisit, you know, the, the archaeology and historical thing that we've already done. 
Um, I, I'm just a little weary that, you know, again, we're, we're at the one, in, you know, the goal line, and this is something that, you know, as we came out of the tunnel to start the game, would have been, you know, the most benefits, you know, would have fit into the process the easiest. I think what we kind of need to know is what our real chances are on the sidewalk. I think they may be ramp, and how much stuff will be covered, and what, yeah. what, how much money we're we talking about. So we're working on that, and I need to talk to a little bit more. It's always a crapshoot, but um, I would say that you would know before a public meeting on the utilities as to whether you have the grant or not. The only problem is, is that the steps that you need to take with the grant, we've already gone through some of those steps and have successfully or almost painfully have gotten there. Mm -hmm. And whether you want to revisit that, I just... Um, and do you think if those that work is not transferable? I gotta find that out. Yeah. I, gotta well, find, I gotta, need to ask see, a little bit more questions. Didn't we have the design all done for the sidewalk? On over here too. So and all sidewalks design is done. Design's not the issue. I'm talking. Yeah, I know. I'm talking. I know. Construction engineer. I'm talking easements. I'm talking. I'm talking. Grant I'm talking FEMA. Yeah, it's federal money. So grant not FEMA, but uh, the NEPA process. You yeah, can get, you can yeah, get yeah. an exemption for that, but uh, it. I'm just putting it out there. I'm just, I think it is a, it's one of those things that I think financially will make very much sense for us. I'm just, at some point you may decide that you're fourth and one and why give up the artists you've already gained. I love football. I was thinking hockey, but you know. I want to hear my thoughts out loud. Sure. About, I was kind of thinking that if we get this grant money, of course, I'm sure nobody, you probably don't want to put it off another year. But if you put it off another year, the state will pay for the five, but then pay for the payment. Maybe sometime we'll get rid of this house and we might have some money where we wouldn't have to take on you know, a huge amount of long term debt. Wait, which house? Oh, the house. The 21. Yeah. So, yeah, I, patience might be a virtue at this point. I think I, I, I agree. Um, I'm uh, the only concern I have. Why, after all these years, am I worried? I don't know. Is that it'll never happen? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, I think it will happen. Anyway. So I think it's a legitimate discussion. I've already talked to Peter Gregory and uh, Rita about um, if it if we got the grant, there's no doubt it would happen in 2021 and not 2020. And I've heard mixed things from the various things I've seen, seen on the, the website or the internet. The last time I heard officially from the state was that it was going to be 2021 that they do Route 5. Um, every now and then I hear 2020, but um, that would probably fit. We're more connected, we're more aligned with the state of Vermont with the grant project. Um, I just would pay me if I've got to revisit he spent some stuff, but anyway, I would just. Um, so, Matt, you think the state would pay for the Well, if they're going to, no, but they should pay for the road if they're going to repave the old one. Why wouldn't they repave the new one? That seems reasonable. We did the same thing in St. Jay when um, there was a, we, we had a big uh, combined sewer overflow project up there, and St. Jay was all dug up. And um, the state was scheduled to repave Route 2, coming through from Danville and over to Maine, essentially. And we incorporated that into the project, and, and they paid that. I think we did the base layer, and then they came and did the, the, the three inch over. So it is possible. It's, I think it's a, valid, it's a valid thing. I just, you know, I think that, yes, we need to know the amount, but I'm just putting it out there that with money comes strings.
Bill is going in for surgery Thursday. Going to leave her short-handed. Um, rec department, um, John uh, hired Jack Boimer. I believe he starts, if not this week, next Tuesday after Memorial Day. Uh, buildings and Grounds um, is going out today or tomorrow for advertisement. And uh, green up file Tetson from everything I saw seemed to be a success. Okay, if I can forward you out finance and delinquent taxes, but there's nothing about delinquent taxes. Has there been any change on the 21? Yeah. 21 properties, if anyone. Tax notices have gone out. I believe several of them have received them okay. at this point in time. Okay. You send those registered, or how do you send them? I believe one goes registered and one goes regular. Paving okay, started on Brownsville Road. It has started? It is started this week, yeah. Oh, let's see. They yes. haven't started reclaiming, but they've... they did a little. I specifically told them. Oh, they started ditching and, and doing the... They started doing the shoulder work today. So I suspect by Friday at best or Tuesday after Memorial Day, they should be just about wrapped up. Put anything on reclaim data. I think Wednesday. Sorry, I'm going to go over the way. In yeah. Day. That'd be some, I've never seen it. I bet you that'd be something to see. When, what, when is it? I don't know what it is, but it's some sort of drum with probably huge spikes on it that tears the road apart. So it's a granular surface so they can grade it. Mm. So it doesn't take it away? It just leaves it? No, it will put, leave it on the road and then grade it up. Maybe Wednesday and Thursday, with paving Friday and then possibly Tuesday, I think was the schedule. Or if they can squeeze it all in, they would. Does this mean that the surface that they put in the is a I don't remember the spec, but I think it's still a three inch. I think it's still a three inch overlay. Hmm. Or a one inch. Uh, Base and then two inches, make it three when combined. I don't, I don't remember at this point. Two things. One, um, I, I did meet with Wynn Johnson this morning, and, and they're very happy to be able to help us with a greater operation. And they, we're about to do best road, and then the rain stopped it, but they just did best road. Okay, so we're headed out that way, I guess today, but the rain altered that. But it was a uh, initially beneficial, kind of, we'll help you, because we know you'll help us if we need it. And, and the second one is I just, uh, I know it's not directly the select board business, but I, I don't know if we've heard anything from the school board, with how they're moving along with the safety issues. Okay. Did you meet with, um, I meet with Christine on Thursday, but um, I haven't, um, I had some initial back and forth after the weekend after that kind of went on. I haven't heard very much since. Do you meet with her every Thursday? No. no. This was discussed, the, um, it was to discuss further what would be entailed with the town of Windsor if the town was interested in pursuing a resource officer. Why would they need to, you know, contract with the town, compared to just the school, what would be involved, um, all that. It's my impression that um, internally the school needs to also decide, kind of have a come to Jesus moment as to whether they truly want a resource officer, whether the support is there from their board, 
when the sport is there for the parents. Um, and I think that that needs to be fleshed out a little bit before we, we were to pick that up. Is one of the options for the four schools to share one person? So Weathersfield does not, they've got their own PD and they don't get involved in it. Right now, Windsor and West Windsor have a resource officer. Well, let me, share. let me rephrase that, yeah. Windsor has one, a contract with West Windsor. West Windsor spends, you know, the guy spends maybe a day or two over there. So is one option for the three schools then to share? Yes. Well, last I had heard, I think the, the vision, I think that exists in the short term would be that the person would spend two days in Heartland out of the five. I think the benefit, if the school were to be interested in this, above and beyond just the two days a week, I think that it allows the school to enter into a relationship with Windsor PD. You know, I think that after some of those events, they struggled a little bit to get a police officer on the scene or something like that after the fact. Um, there's just a, you've got somebody that's, you just got some flexibility, you know, if something were to happen in a particular school, I think the person can spend more time there and then kind of make up the other two a little bit later on type thing. Students are a whole lot more familiar with one person than, you know, multiple, but um, I, my perception is, is that there needs to be some thought of the school. So I thought about mountain climbing instead of football. Like you get to a certain point, and you're almost there, and then you fall back. I thought football, I kind of liked all the time. So have you covered everything, Dave? I'm done. No cars. I, I can't. I'm getting the evil eye from Martha here <laughs> to move on and be done. <clears throat> you got anything more, Phil? When I start to repeat myself, it's all. I guess we're all done with